told me to check my hair for confetti. <laughs> the last time I was on stage in Bloomington, in front of a crowd of people, I was high on ecstasy. And it ended up being one of the scariest and most scarring experiences of my life. I used to do a lot of drugs for a long time, about a decade, which may not seem like much, but when you consider that I'm 27, that's a pretty significant portion of my life. Why was I using? It began as a way to have fun. Later, it turned into a way to punish myself so that other people couldn't beat me to it. Eventually, it became a way to avoid reality, to avoid myself, my pain, my anger, all the thoughts and feelings I didn't know how to handle or express. Abandonment, loss, a lack of control. I turned to alcohol primarily for quite some time, but then I found different highs, different energies and experiences. They were all, however, rooted in avoidance and extremism, a way to feel or not to feel. Eventually, I found I was completely dependent on these substances without really knowing how I had arrived at that place, dependent on these crutches to help me walk. Caffeine for energy and inspiration, tobacco for distraction and social inclusion, sugar for celebration and comfort, marijuana for laughter and happiness and stress management, alcohol for fun, right? And the most extreme, self-abuse. Blackout after blackout. Morning after morning of hating myself for the decisions I had made the night before, yet time and time again returning to the cycle. Adderall and Ritalin to perform scholastically, mushrooms and LSD to expand my mind. But I never tripped alone, no. To go down the rabbit hole by myself was way too scary. And even in really good company, I often had terrible experiences, no doubt brought on by the well of unacknowledged fear within myself. And <laughs> ecstasy, Molly, as we called it, MDMA. Molly, to move, to feel, to connect. The love and high I experienced on this drug was unlike any other. And my hardest, fastest, and most intense addiction with the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. All these substances I used to keep the pendulum swinging from one extreme to the other avoiding the knowledge of myself that waited in the middle ground and all of the trauma I had repressed and was simultaneously creating that would one day have to be dealt with. I was terrified to know myself, to show myself, afraid of everyone else's opinions, afraid of my own beliefs that no longer served me. I've heard it said that how you do anything is how you do everything. For much of my life, I struggled with eczema. It's related, I promise. Um, as a kid, it was just really dry skin, but as I got older, it became this extremely itchy affliction, and I would scratch myself raw, enjoying the relief that came in the moment, not thinking about the pain that would follow immediately after, or the wounds that I was creating. And once they were created, I couldn't let them heal. I couldn't stand to breathe through it. If any of you have ever read Louise Hay's book, You Can Heal Your Life, you know that there's an index in the back of physical disorders and then the probable causes or the thought patterns in our brain that likely created these diseases. It says that skin protects our individuality. Not ever having felt totally safe being me, that made a lot of sense. And my skin problems manifested in itching, itching to get out or get away, as the index suggests. So in life, I used drugs to scratch this itching desire to escape. And I would scratch just as hard and as deep as I did my skin, relishing the temporary relief, avoiding the real work I knew it would take to confront the deeper issue present. For years, God, so long, I wanted to be sober, just as I wanted to be rid of my eczema. I wanted the end result, but I was scared to experience the discomfort that I knew would accompany the healing. So I put it off, and I kept scratching. 
And then one day in April of this year, I had a high idea before going to bed. What about just one year of sobriety? Not a lifelong commitment, but just one long enough to crawl up out of the hole and look down and evaluate the damage. Yeah, right? I'd seen people do things like this on the internet, always with life-changing results. And I got swept up in my cannabis-inspired enthusiasm and started thinking about all of the ways that my life could change. How would I grow? What could I accomplish? What would I learn about myself? I wanted so badly to change, but I didn't know where to start, and I didn't think that I could do it alone. Paulo Coelho says that when you want something, all the universe conspires in helping you to achieve it. So there are two women in my life who have had similar yet unique histories with substance abuse. And our histories have oftentimes been shared. The most monumentous point in this history being when we were 15, all drinking together, and one of us almost died. In fact, her heart stopped for four minutes before she was resuscitated. Our history hasn't always been so terrible. There's been a lot of good in it, too. And to call these women my best friends doesn't even begin to encompass what they are to me. They are my soul sisters. So I came to them, and I am beyond grateful to say that they accepted the invitation to join me for a year of sobriety. Not so coincidentally, they too were finally ready to make a change. So we started constructing the Sober Project. That's what we call it. And uh, we were terrified to take this step together, but also so ready to learn to live without these vices, to grow, to know ourselves more fully. It was decided in April that June 21st would be the perfect start date. We wanted to give ourselves plenty of time to prepare to take on this you know, shift that we were going to create in our lives, but also it's the summer solstice. And what better way to commemorate the end of our dark days of drug use than to begin on the day of the year with the most light? <laughs> Good, right? <laughs> Gotta pay attention to the heavens. So once I came um, committed to this desire in my heart to know myself more fully, God started sending me signs to answer my most pressing question. Why had I been living with so much fear anyway? In May this year, Florence and the Machine released a song called Hunger. It is so good. And there's one line that has stuck with me ever since. I thought the love was in the drugs, but the more I took, the more it took away, and I could never get enough. And then around that time, uh, my husband had just started to read a new book. It wasn't even on drugs or anything like that, but he stopped one night to read aloud a passage, or just a line that he found partic particularly interesting. Physicians tell us that biochemically, love shares a lot of the same exhilarating effects that amphetamines produce. Hmm. You'll remember that Molly, which is an amphetamine, was my most intense addiction. And that book that I mentioned earlier by Louise Hay has been in my possession for years, but it wasn't until I was facing a year of sobriety that I felt called to look up addiction. And do you know what the probable causes are? <clears throat> One, running from the self. Yes, okay, I knew that. Two, fear. I knew that too. Three, not knowing how to love the self. <sighs> oh, love. I was missing love. More specifically, love for myself. But why should I love myself? I had done so many things wrong and hurt so many people along the way that I already had a hard enough time believing that anyone else could genuinely love me, let alone that I deserved to be loved by someone else. Why was I worth loving? I got an answer. An author by the name of Marianne Williamson came into my life. She says that the universe showers you with love, not because of what you have done, or have not done, but because of who you are, a child of God. She teaches that fear is the absence of love, not the opposite, as I had always thought, but in fact, the absence of it, and that in love, fear cannot exist. Love is the only thing that is real. Everything else is an illusion. 
And there are no wrong turns, only times when we deviate from this truth of love and give more credence to fear and doubt. And when this happens, God is like a GPS that automatically reroutes us to the path of love in every single moment, as long as fear does not stand in the way. Wow, I am loved for who I am. There is only love. I've done nothing wrong, I've just forgotten how to love myself and God will always remind me if I just let go and believe. I had always theoretically believed that love conquers all, that all you need is love. Dun, 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 dun. Right? But the depth of my belief was shallow and so my results were equally as shallow. And as Marianne Williamson says, theory alone does not change our lives, but theory activated by mental shifts and behavioral follow-up becomes nothing short of miraculous help in even the most troubled times. So I had the theory, and these revelations on love had sparked the mental shift, but then what about the behavioral follow-up? Change is not easy, as Disney would have you believe it to be like at the end of Frozen, when Elsa suddenly realizes that love will thaw a frozen heart. Love will thaw, love, of course. And then she instantly melts away all that frozen fear-based chandra that she's carried with her her entire life, mind you. No, that's not realistic. That's not what happened for me. So then how did I begin to love myself after years of self-abuse and undermining my value? Well, I'm not doing it alone. These two women in my life, when we agreed to do this project together, we came together to form this triangle, the strongest shape in nature, mind you, of strength and divine feminine support. We love one another unconditionally and because of who we are. When one of us is struggling, we say to her, oh my God, I've been there, I know what you are going through, you are so strong, I believe in you, you've got this. If one of us slips up, we're human. We say to her, I'm not angry with you, don't feel guilty. You are obviously meant to go through this to reach a more profound realization of truth. And when one of us has an accomplishment to share, we shower her with love and congratulations. And it's not always so easy, it's not all rainbows and butterflies, right? We trigger, we trigger one another too. We're addicts, we're blind leading the blind, right? Um, but we're honest enough with one another because we love one another enough that we can say, hey, you're putting a lot on me right now and it's really, I don't know if I can handle this. And then we have an open discussion about it. Like, why can't you handle it? Why is this triggering you? Why was I putting too much on you? Maybe I've given up the self-care practices that I committed to doing this year. This happened to me last weekend. Seriously, this just happened. And we came full circle and it brought us together even more and created more strength. Wouldn't it be great if we could treat ourselves this way, the way that I'm talking about treating these women? Well, the thing is, I am, because you see, these women are my mirrors. To see their addiction is to see my addiction. To feel their pain and struggle is to feel my own. To know their strength and beauty is to know myself as strong and beautiful. And to show them love is to love myself. So, how have I overcome fear? With love and support. And not just support from these two women, but from so many people, my husband, other soul sisters, family, friends, all these people that have come out to support me in this monumental life shift that I'm having. Look at all of this miraculous help born from the most troubled of times. On June 21st, I was at monumental yoga, and I had never heard of Walk the Talk. This is the first day of sobriety, remember? And I was walking along the line of booths and I saw theirs and no one reached out or said anything to me but I felt myself being pulled back like a magnet and I walked right up and I said, hi, what is this? What are you people, what do you do? <laughs> and when I learned about the auditions for overcoming fear, I had this overwhelming urge to participate even though I didn't know then what I was going to say. I had just started to walk the path. Today, I have been sober for just over four months. That, that is a miracle. <laughs> and even more miraculous still, I have begun to love myself so much that I feel safe opening up to all of you. <sighs> Thank you. <laughs> Sharing my story, not fearing judgment or ridic ridicule, but genuinely hoping that I can be the mouthpiece that God uses to shake you from your fear. 
however that may look in your life. So here I am, on stage in Bloomington, in front of a crowd of people again. This time to shine my love and light so that you may know your own. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.